Hi, good morning or afternoon for everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today's webinar. We are just going to wait uh, a minute or two just so we can have uh, more people join. So we will start soon, so thank you. Cool, so I think we can start. So thank you everyone for joining today's webinar. My name is Brett Ferdeman and I'm part of the MGI Africa and, or I'm part of the MGI Africa and Europe team. And I'm very happy to welcome you to today's webinar. So we are very pleased to have Dr. Adelabu from NextGen and Dr. Mushimenya from MGI to talk about the topic, Next Generation Sequencing, a Gold Standard in Genomic Research. So while all of you would have seen the abstract while undergoing online registration, in this webinar, MGI together with NextGen Molecular Supplies will introduce and discuss the DNB-seq technology and its applications with a specific focus on whole genome sequencing. So whole genome sequencing is a technique that has revolutionized biosciences in many ways and has been instrumental in the identification of gene functions and their involvement in disease, the identification of inherited, inherited disorders, the characterization of the mutations that drive cancer progression and the tracking of disease outbreaks, for example. So the speakers for today will be uh, Dr. Adeyemi Adelabu, uh, who is a molecular biologist and application specialist uh, at the at NextGen Molecular Supplies in South Africa, and Dr. Matsepo Mushimenya, who is our uh, very experienced field application scientist, uh, who is based in South Africa at MGI. So with that, I thank you again for joining, and I welcome our speakers to share their knowledge and experience today. So Adeyemi, you may share your screen. Okay, thank you, Brett. Um, you cannot stop sharing the screen. Okay, thank you for going. Good morning to you all. My name is Adela Padiemi, uh, the Application Specialist at NGMS, the Next Gen Molecular Supply situated in South Africa, Johannesburg. And today I'll be taking us through the introduction to NGMS as a distributor of MGI automation and NGMS and NGS platforms in South Africa. And today, I'm focusing on the overview of our company, which is the NGMS, 
as well as the MGI pro product portfolio that we manage as uh, the authorized local distributor of MGI automation and NGS platforms. Now to our company overview. And the MS, next generation, next gen molecular supplies. We are a leading supplier of equipment and solutions for biological research, diagnostic, and point of care markets in South Africa and other regions in Africa continent. And we have our company represented in different regions of Africa, in East Africa, West Africa, Central Africa, as well as Southern Africa. And our headquarters is situated in Johannesburg here. And we are a dynamic team of eight young professionals under the leadership of our CEO and our MD, the person of Dr. Gerard Kimby, who is pros in the area of medicine, molecular cell, molecular and cell biology, coupled with his over 15 years of experience in the scientific market has helped elevate this company within a short period of establishment. And the company has found a foot in the scientific market across Africa as a leading supplier of high quality instruments and effective solution. And the range of equipment and products we supply span across molecular research and diagnostics, such as return PCR, what is corresponding kit, QPCR instrument, and nucleic acid extraction and isolation, which, which are automated. We also have solutions for pathogen detection, for communicable diseases and high quality DNA and RNA only goes for our PCR. Also, we have contributors such as append of tubes, PCR tubes, optical films, magnetic beak that can be used for your nucleic acid extraction and isolation. And also, we also have our pipettes that are branded that and this pipette fits into different pipettes. And all these are at competitive pricing. And we pride ourselves with our core value that has made us stabilize in the market and going forward. And the core value of our company is to provide quality automated instrument and effective solution to research and diagnostic industry. Now, once to achieve this, we have various partners across the globe, as you can see on the screen display, we have Anatolia, Asagini, Baution, Baunium, Magbio, Metabion, and Baution. So these are producers of high quality equipment and instrument. And of course, we have MDI, making great innovation. And for the benefit of those that might just be hearing about MGI for the first time, MGI is a leading manufacturer of high throughput genetic sequencer, sequencers of various uh, capacity and provider of core tools and technology to lead life science through intelligent innovation. Now, uh, in request to support the global customers, MGI has got global service network, uh, the Training centers, production center is situated at Riga, and we have marketing services. That they have marketing services networks span across six continents, with forty training and after school services centers and thirty-one business centers across the globe. As you can see on the slide, now we are going to serve the global uh, customers. They have they have different applications that support multiple industries range from pathogen and microbial detection to tumor genetic testing, biodiversity research, forensics and complex disease genetic testing up to biomaterial. We can see that the application covers multiple and diverse uh, industry. And oh, they have uh, over 1,000 users of the automation and sequencers across the globe, and over 2,000 instruments has been installed so far. And for those that are in academics, you see that using MGI automation instruments and sequencers 
over 1,200 articles have been published and these are available in our impact factor journals. Now to the MGI product portfolio that we manage as MG, as MGMS here in South Africa. Now, as a, a constantly evolving company, I mean MGI, the product portfolio is constantly expanding and currently it can be divided into three, which are sequencers and sequencing reagents, automatic solutions and automation systems and corresponding reagents. So this slide is showing some of the instrument, some of the instruments manufactured by MGI that we are able to supply in South Africa. Uh, from the top left, we have the sample transfer processing, which is fully automated. Also, we have the dedicated nucleic acid extraction. This is also automated, and this can uh, be used by a local I mean, small capacity laboratory, that I mean the NE32, which can extract 32 samples within nine to 10 minutes. And we have uh, a bigger one that can extract up to 384 samples, that is the NE384. Also, we have the automated sample, we have the automated sample preparation system, which can be used for nucleic acid extraction as well as library as well as library preparation for the next generation sequencing workflow. And of course, we have the, we have the sequencing instrument of different of different capacity. So now looking at the MGI sequencing instruments, as I've said earlier, we have from the low throughput to the ultra high throughput capacity, the DNB seq G50, G DNB seq G400, and DNB seq T7. So we just go to talk about the instrument one after the other. Now to the DNBSIC G50. Uh, I know my colleague will talk about the DNB uh, seq technology shortly. But with this instrument, you can have up to 150 gigabase per run and it is adaptive to use one flow cell at a time, either the large flow cell or the small flow cell. Or the small flow cells, you can get up to 100 million reads and 500 million reads for the large flow cells. Um, with the with the read length range between single end 50 to tier end 150. And the applications that are compatible with this instrument range from um, small old genome, that is the microbial old genome sequencing, targeted and targeted sequencing, low pass old genome sequencing, as well as beta genomics. So now to uh, the comprehensive and flexible sequencer, which is known as the G400. On this instrument, you can get up to 1.4 terabases per run. And one of the beauty of this instrument and the advantage is that this instrument is compartmentalized to run different applications independent of each other at the same time. And you can see with small flow source, which has two lane. You can generate up to uh, five, uh, 550 million reads. And with the light flow cells that has four lanes, you can generate up to 1.8 billion reads. And the read length compatible with this instrument ranges from single end 50 to peer end 300. And the applications that are possible of this instrument, ranging from all genome sequencing, all exome sequencing, and RNA sequencing of large uh, genome of that is the uh, animal animal genome, human genome, and large microbial genome can be run on this instrument. 
Now to our to uh, FGIDN B67 is considered the most capable sequencer on planet. And with this instrument, you can get a lot of data and it's suitable for large number of samples or big projects like human population uh, genome, uh, genomic projects. And it, it asks for independent flow cells that can give up to 5 billion read per flow cells. Now, to the bioinformatics solutions uh, provided by MGI. So this is some, these are some of the product that can be provide, provided by MGI. That is, we have the Mega Boat Workstation and MGI Zetron. This product are, are known as uh, accelerator. That is the main advantage for using this solution is, the significant, is that they significantly reduce the sequencing time. For example, if you are to sequence uh, an old, uh, old genome of human, they can take you up to like 30, 30 hours. It can be significantly reduced to like 20 hours thereabout. And also the MakerBot workstation comes with different software which, which can be used for the analysis of the sequence data. And the MakerBot workstation is compatible with uh, G50 and G100, while the MGI Zetron is compatible with T7. And for the sake of our listeners today, if you want to know more about MGI and GMS, you can visit our website on www.ngms.co.za as well as www.en.mgitech.com. Dot com. Thank you for your time and enjoy the webinar further. I think now I will invite Dr. Matepo to take us through the technology, as I've said earlier, and the whole genome sequencing application. Dr. Marcepo. Over to you, Dr. Marcepo. Thank you, Adiyemi. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, whatever time zone you are listening from. So as the previous speakers have mentioned, uh, my name is Matt Tepo and I'm a field application specialist at um, MGI based in South Africa. So the contents of the presentation will be looking into the DNB technology of MGI, as well as um, delving more into the whole genome sequencing application. So the DNB SIG technology that I'll be talking about um, is anchored on our DNA nanoball, which um, is uh, where the, the abbreviation is DNB. So if you see DNB, you will know that it stands for our DNA nanoball. And I'll be talking about um, in, in a few um, seconds. So with all, MG, with all NGS um, workflows, there are four parts to it. So there is library preparation of your nucleic acids, and then those libraries need to be prepared for sequencing in such a way that they'll be single-stranded and ready for sequencing. And here at MGI, our template preparation is called DNB generation. And then there is sequencing of your templates, as well as um, uh, analysis of the data. So our DNB seq technology um, can be uh, divided into three, which is the making of a DNA nanoball, the use of a patent array, which is a flow cell, and the sequencing itself. So when we have our 
double-stranded DNA molecule with adapters ligated to it, whether they're barcoded or non-barcoded, most of the time with other technologies, that is the library. So for us at MGI, we go further and denature this library into single strands. We circularize those strands and we get an enzyme with high fidelity and displacement capability to replicate around the circle, forming a long strand of single uh, of um, single stranded DNA molecule. So the enzyme will go around the circle, replicate, and when it gets to the beginning where it started, it would have a strand that is distracting its way to replicate around the same circle again. So it will just simply displace it and go around the circle again. So this goes as long as we need it to. It is time dependent. And once we have got the right amount or right number of copies of this original circularized DNA, then we can stop the reaction. And this long strand, that is single stranded, will fold onto itself, forming a structure at the bottom that looks like a ball, which we call our DNA nanoball. These nanoballs will then be ready because they're single stranded. So they're now ready for sequencing. They are a good template. They will be loaded onto a flow cell, which in this case is our patent array. If you look at the picture that I'm circling around with my cursor, you will see that there are white spots where the green nanoballs are sitting. Now, these are perfectly and uh, precisely um, compartmentalized where there is an optimal distance between adjacent nanoballs to ensure that during sequencing, when the machine is reading the sequence, there is no crosstalk between two adjacent nanoballs and there is no disturbance between them so that um, there is clarity in the, um, the calling of bases. This flow cell will then be loaded onto our instruments where the sequencing will happen. So during the sequencing, we will have primers that nail and uh, um, bind to our template. And then we will supply the flow cell with labeled nucleotides for our standard massively parallel sequencing. We have four labeled nucleotides. And the enzyme that we use will incorporate these nucleotides flow by flow or cycle by cycle, one at a time. And this will be happening across the whole flow cell. So that's why it's mass massively parallel and on each DNB. So once there's incorporation of our nucleotides, there will be excitation with the laser in the machine to excite the fluorophore that is used to label the nucleotide. And then the fluorophore will emit light of a certain wavelength, which will be captured by the instrument. And because the instrument is programmed to know what type of light comes from which nucleotide, it will then translate that using its software from the signals into the bases in a process called base calling. The advantage of our rolling circle amplification and our DNA nanoball uh, formation um, is explained on the right. So this process of forming a nanoball is linear, is through linear amplification. So you heard I've spoken about the enzyme will go around the circle multiple times, producing copies of the original strand. Because this is not PCR amplification, there is no error propagation or carryover of error from one copy to the next. For example, if the enzyme is producing a copy, it produces the first copy correctly. And then in the second copy, there is a mistake. The mistake will not be carried over to the third copy because the enzyme will be making these copies from the original strand. This also, because we are not using PCR, also makes sure that there is no bias um, during the, the sequencing process. And also there is um, not a lot of duplication. So on the left is just a depiction of how um, with PCR amplification, because it is doubling or exponential amplification, should an error happen at any point, it most likely will be carried over to the next cycle. And we do not want that. So this is why our DNB-seq technology um, 
has been performing brilliantly. So for this slide, it shows what I was saying about the formation of the DNA nanoball through rolling circle amplification. It is just to show that from, if you look at the, the circle in the middle and the strand that is coming out, that is being made, the left part from, from the left, sorry, from the right to the left, this will be copy number one, this will be copy number two, and so on and so forth until it's long and it, roll, it, it rolls onto itself. So the main advantages or the key advantages of having these low amplification biases, low duplication rates, and low error accumulation is obviously for the interpretation of your data. You want the data that you get to be as accurate as possible so that your precision and sensitivity of variance um, is very high. This is just an animation showing the enzyme going around the circle, following the denaturation and circularization and the formation of a DNA nanoball. These nanoballs will then be loaded onto our patent array. You can see clearly that there are many nanoballs that are sitting on nicely compartmentalized spots um, to ensure um, clean signals during sequencing. The structure of the circularized um, DNA looks um, like this. So on the circle, the green part will be the insert and the gray part will be part of the adapters that would have been ligated to our double-stranded um, fragment before denaturation. And there will be a barcode. It could be on either of the adapters or on one of them. So you could ask yourself, since the circularized DNA already has um, priming um, sites, as you can see on the slide, for both the insert and the barcode region, then why do we need to make a nanoball? So we need to make a nanoball, which is obviously multiple copies of the single circularized um, DNA template, because if it's only the one molecule, the, the circularized DNA, it's like you are lighting a match and the sequencer will probably not pick up the, the signal um, or pick it up accurately. So with the DNA nanoball, it is, it comprises of 300 to 500 copies of the circularized DNA. And this creates a bonfire effect, meaning that the signal is now amplified and it's clear for the instrument to capture and to translate into our basis. This is the, the, the workflow of, um, of our sequencing. Um, it is synthesis or, or incorporation, imaging, and then between each cycle will be a cleavage um, step to make sure that after one nucleotide is incorporated and read, and we know the, the machine has captured the signal, we cleave um, the, the floor of four and a blocker so that we are ready for the next incorporation. And the data output format that comes out from the sequencing experiment will be uh, fast Q files. Going into the whole genome sequencing application and how we support our users at MGI, I'll start by looking at whole genome sequencing in general. We all know that a whole genome of an organism is all of its DNA, which includes exons and introns and all the intergenic regions. And we know that whole genome sequencing is determining the content and the order of all these nucleotides that encompass the DNA. So why are we sequencing whole genomes? Whole genomes, we know that now it's very cheap or it, it's, it's um, relatively cheap to, to sequence them instead of using something like Sanger sequencing where it's one gene at a time and it takes a long time. You can't multiplex samples in the same tube. So here with whole genome sequencing, we are able um, as researchers to answer a variety of questions. We can look at the identification of known variants of biological importance in individuals or populations. We can look at the discovery of novel variants or novel causative agents of diseases. We can also look at the identification of known and unknown genes. And then we can look at the assembly of genomes. Now, it's well, all well and good that you um, want to do next generation sequencing and focus on whole genome sequencing as a project, 
But before one embarks on such project, they need to make sure that the right amount of instrument is selected that will generate the right amount of data to answer a research question. So at MGI to support our whole genome um, sequencing workflow, um, we have got three types of strategies. Starting from the right is um, sequence can be um, generated by um, the panels in a multiplex PCR experiment. And these can be ligated to adapters and sequence, but this is would be for small genomes, right? Because for a large genome, it would quite be impossible to, to make panels and try to sequence it that way. So if you are looking at um, a large genome, uh, as well as small genomes in some cases, we also have got long fragments that can be um, tagged and sequenced. And these are mainly for our structural and copy number variants, as, as well as you know, assembly. And here, the solution is our STLFR, which is single tube long fragment um, read re technology. And then um, on the left is the conventional um, way of doing whole genome sequ sequencing, which is by uh, fragmenting your DNA material or your cDNA into short fragments, and then um, ligating that to adapters and sequencing that. For the focus of this presentation, it will be for, for, the, for the short short fragments. And this can be done, the fragmentation of your nucleic acids can be done either mechanically or enzymatically, and we have got solutions or kits for all of these. And I'll go into, into them shortly. So for the mechanical sharing, we've got a universal kit. And then for enzymatic, we have got MGI Easy FS library prep sets. And we've got a fast version of these. So the features of our library prep, some of the unique ones would be that they are fully enzy enzymatic for, for your library prep. And then some are PCR free. So if you want to have a completely PCR free um, library and sequencing data, you can do that because our nanoball is already PCR free. Our kits are compatible with FSPE um, samples. And then we offer both single and dual barcodes for our genomes. And then also we have unique molecular identifiers. So looking at the universal and FS kits for whole genome sequencing, I will not read this word by word, but it is just to show at the top that these are our different um, kits. And uh, we've got the universal kit and the different types of FS kits, both normal and fast and both PCR and PCR free. The differences would be in the sample type that you're going for and also in the input amount that you have. It, it just depends on what your, your question is as well. Sometimes you want to go for a PCR free workflow, but you do not have the right amount of um, material to, to go with this workflow. So you need to relook at your strategy or go and re-extract. And also the turnaround time, if it's important to you, you need to select this accordingly. And also one other important thing is how many samples you're going to multiplex per lane or per run. If you are looking at multiplexing more than 96 samples per lane or per run, you, you should look at um, the FAST series, which has dual barcodes, up to 192 for the PCR-based workflow and the PCR-3 workflow ha has got up to 384 um, dual barcodes. So there are different options of um, executing the library prep. It could be manually um, done or done with our automation systems that um, Adeyemi was talking about. Whether you are doing it manually or the machine is doing it for you, um, there are certain steps that has to be, um, that the, the material has to be taken through until we get our DNA nanoball. We start with the fragmentation, whether it's mechanical or enzymatic, and then there will be a size selection to select the correct um, size that you need according to the sequencing kit that you're going to use. 
And after the site selection, we will have end repair and a tailing to prepare our site selected fragments for our ductal ligation. And then if you are working with a PCR based library prep, you will do a PCR. If it's PCR free, you will not do a PCR. The next step will be to denature our fragments that are adapter ligated into single strands, circularize them, and then take them into uh, DNA nanobore making. Throughout this whole process, to make sure that you have got the uh, right amount of data and good quality data, it is not enough to have a good sequencer and a good technology. There are certain QC steps that you have to make sure that are checked and are correct before you proceed to the next step. And the most important one being that the initial sample needs to be of high quality. So the concentration needs to be right for what you're doing, the purity and the integrity needs to be proper because this will determine the quality of data that you will get. We all know in NGS, we have a saying, garbage in, garbage out. So once that is sorted out and it's done, chances are everything else will go smoothly, but you still need to check. There's a QC step, after size selection, there are certain things that you need to take into consideration during the library preparation workflow, um, some of which are the amount of uh, adapters you are adding, and this will correspond to the amount of input material you have, as well as the amount of PCR cycles that you are going to do, which will correspond to the amount of initial input you have. We also QC the library once it's done, which will be your secularized um, DNA, and then after that, after making a DNA nanobore, you also need to do a QC because there is a, there is a certain requirement to go onto your loading and your sequencing. So looking into the performance of some of these um, kits that I, I was speaking about, using the human standard um, NA12878, we looked at um, the performance of the, the, the kit um, using 50 nanograms of input and 300 nanograms of input. The performance was similar when we looked at uh, mismatch rates, mapping rates, the uh, precision and sensitivity for single nucleotide um, polymorphisms. Um, but the, the main difference, some of which are obvious, would be like the duplication rate. So when you input lower or, or, or less sample, uh, you will definitely get more duplication because you have to introduce more PCR cycles to amplify your or to enrich your library. Also, it becomes a little bit more tricky to be precise and sensitive when it comes to um, insertions and deletions. So another, um, sorry about that. Uh, another performance that we looked at was how repeatable um, is this kit. So the, um, the FS kit uh, is repeatable. Uh, when we looked at making libraries from um, tuberculosis and also for the human standard, 10 repeats showed that uh, when we measured our library yield at the end of the library preparation, we had um, around 700 nanograms um, of yields for the human um, G G DNA. And then for the TB, we had slightly below 200 nanograms in total. Okay, so now looking at the universal kit, we did the same experiment with the human DNA and looked at the input of 50 nanograms versus an input of 500. Similar results were, um, were seen where the duplication rate um, is higher if you are starting with lower material and also slightly um, reduced indel, and, uh, indel precision and sensitivity. The same data that I show in the tables uh, can be seen at the bottom with the graphs. So it is important to, 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 to select the right approach and the right input to use, uh, depending on your research question. For a complex genome, obviously the, this duplication rate will not be good. It's too much and it takes away from the amount of data you could get. So in such instances where you're dealing with complex genomes, it is advisable 
that you start with as high, as high input material as you can. So looking at this um, solution, we looked at the library yield across different species, and we saw that we get uh, above 500 nanograms yield at the end of the library prep across human, um, plant, animal, and um, microbes, as well as um, metagenome samples. And then we also look at the repeatability or reproducibility of this uh, solution. And we saw that across 22 rats, there is higher repeatability. Looking at the performance of the PCR versus PCR free, uh, the library prep set, uh, we have two tables here, and this is using the human standard again. Uh, we, got, we are looking at the alignment summary. And with the metrics that we looked at, we found that the duplication rate is significantly reduced for the PCR-free solution versus the PCR-based solution. If that is important for you that you have as little duplication rate as possible, then this is what you need to go for the PCR-free um, workflow, but you need to make sure you have got the right amount of input material to be able to get away with a good library without PCR. And at the bottom here, looking at the variant results, um, when we look at the insertion and deletion precision and sensitivity, we see that with the PCR free, we have um, higher sensitivity and precision for the indels than we do with uh, PCR based. Again, it depends on what you're looking for, the type of genome you're working with, you need to select the right solution. When we also compare further the PCR-free and PCR-based workflows, we see that with the PCR-free one, we are able to cover high GC reach regions and also repeat regions more accurately than with the PCR-based um, workflow. We also looked at the performance of um, our, our, our solution versus a competitor using the, the same standard and uh, mainly paid in 150. And if you look at the table at the bottom, it shows data that we got from a G400 from, I will just say XSeq, um, but yeah, most people can figure out which one would be that. Um, so we looked at five reps of our samples for sequencing with paid in 150. And um, we looked at the kind of data we got against our competitor. So what stood out from the various metrics, ranging from mapping rate to mismatch rate to the precision and sensitivity of SNPs and indels, duplication rate stood out, where our duplication rate was only about um, 2, 2%, around 2%. 2.7% at most, 2.8% at most. And for our competitor, we had, or, or we have data that there was about 5.9% uh, duplication. And then with the indel uh, precision and sensitivity as well, that stood out for us where we had um, higher sensitivity and precision for our insertions and deletions than the competitor. So in terms of um, the amount of data that our different um, sequences can uh, produce, we've already seen with Adeyemi's uh, presentation um, about the, the T7, the G400, the G50. I just wanted to highlight also that um, there is our, on the, on, the on the left, our TX series that can generate um, quite a lot of data if that is needed. Okay, so in terms of publications that we have, also Ariemi has mentioned that we have got many publications in a high impact factor journal. And for our WGS um, workflow or solution, these are published um, for various organisms, bacteria, human, um, insects, plants, animals, as well as organelles. So these are available. And if you cannot find them online, you're welcome to reach out to us to assist you with the uh, publications. Also, there are publications out there that um, 
it covers comparison between our sequences and a competition um, sequences. So they're freely available for you to look at and um, get back to us, uh, should you be interested in our sequences because of the high quality that you will see in those papers. So one of the takeaway messages for this presentation um, should be that at NGI and with NGMS distributing for us in South Africa, we are able to support our clients from sample um, collection in some cases, as well as all the way to report generation um, for, for ease of um, a workflow and for an end-to-end -end solution to your whole genome sequencing workflow. Thank you for your time. Cool, so thank you very much, uh, Matsepo and Adeyemi for sharing today. Um, so just on behalf of everyone, just uh, I would like to say thank you for your time. Um, so we have some questions. So let's look at, I think this one is for uh, Matsepo, just about the MGI technology. So with MGI technology, it states that um, with the DMB seq technology, there is no error accumulation and index hopping. So is this what differentiates MGI technology from others uh, like Illumina that does have error accumulation and index hopping? Thank you for the question. Um, yes, definitely because uh, with our patent array as well as our DNA nanobot that is formed from linear amplification, um, we, we can completely have workflows that bypass PCR altogether from our library preparation with PCR free kits to our template preparation where we are using a PCR free method. So that, that is um, uh, the reason or one of the reasons why we, we have uh, more or less error accum accumulation. And with our patent arrays as well, there will be less uh, cross talking and um, index hopping as well. Great, thank you. Um, and then a, another question, uh, with the large focus on pop gene and biodiversity projects, what is the ultimate capacity MGI sequences can obtain for these large scale projects? Okay, uh, thank you for, for the question again. Um, so you would have seen with the presentation from Adeyemi that our sequences range um, from medium low to, to ultra high throughput. So with the T7, um, getting about six terabases of data in 24 hours, one can do close to 20,000 genomes per annum, which is really good. But if that still is not working and is not enough for your population genomics project, then we can look at the TX series where we have instruments that can be tailored according to your need. And there we can have around 75 terabases of data per run. Wow, so uh, extreme throughput. <laughs> so um, yeah, thank you. Uh, and we also have just a comment from Mina that uh, says uh, that was amazing. Wow, you made something so complex seem so simple. So yeah, thank you uh, to our speakers today and thank you for all for your time. Uh, and with that, I wish you all a good day. So thank you again. Thank you.